Good morning, Real Life family. Happy Sunday. It is wonderful to be together with you again. I am Vanessa, the worship director here, and I'm joined by a couple members of our worship team yet again, Maha and Tyrone. And we're excited to worship with you. So let's jump right in. This song's called Good Grace.
God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of this time. And all point of reference, I spoke to the dark and fleshed out the one. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. And the vapor of your breath and its stars are made to worship so light. I can see your heart. Every burning star is in the fire of praise. Creation sings your praise, and so will I.
Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for never leaving the one behind. We thank you, God, for seeing every single one of us and loving every single one of us. Thank you, God, for being here now, God. Thank you for your love, your grace, your healing. God, we thank you for your truth today, your word. I pray that my family and I, every single person listening, that we would just receive your truth today, God, and your love. We thank you, Father, for surrender everything into your hands, all our worries, um, all our joys, all our hopes, God, we put it all into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What's up, Stace? What's up, Kev? How are you? You know, just another week in quarantine. Gotta love it. But you made it another week. Like, that's the like, way to... Yay! You made Yay! It Everybody made it another week. Good that's job. Right. If you're watching at home, we're just saying welcome to real life. Glad you're tuning in this morning. Yes. Welcome to everybody's favorite part of the morning. That's right. Anyway, <laughs> Stace, you know what I'm realizing that we have not done yet? Um, no, tell me. The Easter chalk challenge prizes have not been given out. Oh, good point. Good point, Kev. So I okay, so I, I think that everybody who participated should get a prize. Because it's really hard to like draw out elaborate art with chalk your face is hilarious first of all um it's not easy are you a chalk artist i'm not a chalk artist so no. everybody who participated should get a prize this is not t-ball stace okay <gasps> not everybody gets a trophy i know we live in that kind of day and age but we're not not everyone can get a prize so we're actually giving i know i'm gonna be the hardliner on this one we're gonna give a prize to okay. most elaborate okay and to the cutest what do you think okay I know you I like think that's a great idea, but I think it's brilliant. <laughs> okay, I can I can get behind that too. Prizes, okay. Cute. Okay, so Go ahead. Yes. I mean, yes. everybody, you know, the kids probably have got the edge on this one just because, you know, kids are super cute and they like go out and it's like a whole family thing. So assuming that we can't give one to every single kid who won, who do you think was the cutest? <gasps> You're going to make me pick? I yes. can't. You're no, I can't pick. Kids. Oh my gosh, and I'm pick every kid who did one. Fine, I'll pick. <laughs> I'm picking <Yeah>. Gavin. <laughs> Gavin <gasps> yes. like five drawings. He worked really hard, as did everybody, but yes. Gavin, good job, buddy. You are going to get a prize coming your way. And most elaborate? Yes, there were some so, so elaborate entries. Like, people, like, taking up their whole chalk walk, like, their whole sidewalk, and going out in the street and yes go ahead no the color i mean the colors were very vivid on this so um i don't know what do you think the duhames <gasps> for sure with their super cool wall like the bricks and all the different colors good job duhames it was Kevin's gonna get you all the winners a prize <laughs> that's know? right so if you're gavin or the duhames you're getting a prize this week uh, we're gonna send you um a little you know prize pack um, maybe some toilet paper. Definitely chalk, toilet paper. You know. Yes, more chalk to keep doing art. That's right. I love it. Okay, hooray, congratulations. Can we give everybody who participated like a, you know, a virtual high five? A round of applause. Oh, a round of applause. And good job. Everybody did such a great job. That's right. So, Stace, I think uh, announcements wise. We're yes. At, uh, if you have a kid or a student at home, you have lots of, lots of resources on the web, right? Yes. Uh, Absolutely. You want to tell us how they can find those? Yeah, so www.reallife.la, R-E-A-L-L-I-S-E dot L-A -L -L -E slash kids gets you resources up through fifth grade. And reallife.la slash students is for sixth through twelfth. They're broken down by age groups. You can find all of the resources there for you. There are stories. There's activities you can do as a family. And additionally, tonight at 5 p.m., we have a kids party happening. So if you've not yet gotten your invitation, if you're wondering what is this about, you can send an email right now, right this second, to kids, not to, but send the email to kids, K-I-D-S, at reallife.la. We would love 
to invite you and see you there. Awesome. Yes. Lots of stuff going on in the life of our family ministry. Your party's happening tonight. We have student ministry, small groups happening all throughout the week. So lots. And can, people can still participate even if they've not been on a Zoom call with their small group before, right? That's Basically. right. We've actually, some of our students have been inviting some of their friends into small group, which is really cool. Kids that I've never even met. So. So cool. Love that. Cool. Way to still be inviters, church. You guys are awesome. That's right. Uh, also happening, not just for kids and students, we have stuff going on for grownups right now too. So we had the first ACTS class this week. Yes, this Wednesday week. night. Uh, if you would like to join us, you can pick up with us on ACTS chapter two this week. And uh, Pastor Jim has been doing his videos. So he does a kind of teaching time on YouTube and uh, Facebook live. And uh, that's at seven o'clock followed by a little discussion on Zoom afterwards. We had uh, quite a few people uh, come in and have a little discussion with us. It was super fun. So uh, you can sign up um, on the web for that one as well. And I think that you're going to put the links on the little like comment section. So be looking for those. You can just click those to sign up to participate in any of the things that we're talking about right now. And then there's Last something but not else. least, giving. Yes. Yeah. If you'd like to give, if you'd like to participate in the ministry that's happening through the way that you guys are still very much the church on the move, um, you can do so by going to a real life.la slash give. There's also a way to text in too, and uh, we can share those resources with you again in the comment section. Good to have you with us this morning, Stace. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, church, for being so incredible. Thank you for how you generously give, how you continue to support and invite new people in. We are so thankful for you. We're going to go to the next thing. All right, so let's continue in worship stays. Okay, bye, bye Kev. Hi, welcome to Real Life Church. I'm Jim Miller, your pastor, and it's good to be with you today. I hope God is blessing you in this in-between season, the season where nothing is quite uh, what it used to be, uh, because God is still powerful in this season. Today, I've got a great message of uh, forgiveness and how forgiven we really are uh, in the midst of this mess. Uh, I have a story of miraculous healing that happened this week and another entry in our viral blessings challenge that I want to share with you. Uh, before we get to all that, I want to make sure that you're ready for next week's uh, worship service. Next Sunday, we're going to celebrate communion together. So make sure that sometime during this week, you get hold of some bread and some grape juice or some crackers and some wine, however you celebrate it uh, at your house, uh, and be ready for that uh, next week. We'll celebrate communion together. Midweek, we'll release a video uh, that'll explain how to uh, celebrate communion in your home. So you can look for that uh, on our Homeschool for the Soul series uh, during the course of this week. Um, I remember when I was a kid, uh, maybe in about first grade, and I was sitting in a classroom, and it came time for the music lesson. And they distributed instruments throughout the room, and we were all going to play along together to a song. And the teacher put in front of me a drum, and I was going to be the drummer. And I looked at this drum and I realized I was going to bang on this drum like a rock star. And I took the drumsticks and I pointed across the room at this cute brunette girl named Shannon, who I used to tease on the playground because I liked her so much. And I pointed those, pointed those at her and I winked because I was about to best Phil Collins. I was about to one-up John Bonzo. And uh, so uh, there were some instructions, but I wasn't paying attention because I had a drum and there was Shannon and everything was good. And uh, then the music started. And I realized there was some point at which I was supposed to come in on the music and play along with it, but I had missed the instruction, so I didn't know where that was. So I sat there with the drumsticks, looking at the drum, and the teacher stared at me, and I stared at her, and I, and I missed the intro. And so she came over to me and said, let me give it to somebody else, and maybe you can play it later. And she took it away from me. And I never became a drummer. I realized at that moment that I was not as good as I thought I was. Well, for some of us, quarantine has been a first music lesson. Quarantine has been our, uh, our wake-up call to the fact that we were not as good as we thought we were. Some of us who thought we were killing it as parents are now only barely not killing somebody who lives in our house. Some of us who thought we were socially mature 
uh, grown up adults are now just trying to spend every day figuring out which boxed wine best pairs with pajamas. Some of us who were confident that we had control over our world and our situation have realized that in the blink of an eye, our health, our wealth, and our control can be taken from us. Can, can be taken from us. We are not as in control as we thought we were. But it's exactly when you realize that the worst can be brought out of you, that God's love is the best. And Jesus wants to speak into the midst of this broken situation and, and show us how much, how much His love surpasses all of our brokenness. I want to show you that today by way of reading one of our letters from our Viral Blessings Challenge. This, remember, is my challenge to, to everybody. When you, when you have to go to the grocery store, as you're going through that checkout line, buy one of the gift cards there in the line and give it to, uh, have, the, have the clerk populate it, uh, put whatever money on it you, you feel appropriate, and then turn around and give it back to the clerk. Uh, maybe get one for the person bagging the groceries too. And say, here, here this is for you. I want to say thank you for being on the front lines and doing what you're doing, uh, and, and thank you for this, and God bless you. Uh, and so many of you have responded to this. So many of you have gone out and done this. This is, this is just great. Uh, and if, you, if you're new to this, if you've just logged in to reallife.la uh, and you're following this for the first time, go back and look at all the stories that we've shared Sunday after Sunday. They're on our, our blog at reallife.la. Uh, so many great stories of people with just deep, caring hearts reaching out for people who are, who are doing these jobs that, that put them at risk and, and just saying thank you. So I've got another uh, entry from our Viral Blessings Challenge for this week that I want to read you. And if you decide to do this, uh, make sure you send me a note to info at reallife.la and tell me the story because I want to share these stories. Okay, Jim, over the past few weeks, my wife and I have been listening to the great stories about real life uh, Los Angeles members who purchased gift cards at the grocery store and gave them to the checkers or, or box people, the people who bag the groceries, at the register. This is such a great idea, and these stories inspired us to do the same. My story, however, has an ending which may bring tears of a different kind to your eyes. I finished my shopping last week and grabbed a gift card off the rack before I got into the well-spaced checkout line. You know, you have to stand six feet apart from each other. When I got to the register, the strapping young lad who served me scanned and bagged everything, and I uh, handed him, I, I had him add $25 to the gift card. His bagger had been momentarily called away, so he was a bit harried with the double duty he had pulled and was hustling to keep the checkout line moving. As he worked, we chatted briefly about these crazy times and agreed that it could not last forever. When he had finished and before I walked away, I handed him the gift card and said, Thank you for all you do for us. This is for you. God bless you. I hesitated a moment, waiting for the tearful thank you, the virtual hug, and the this turned my whole life around comment. I waited for the store to close and the marching band to show up, the eyewitness news van to instantly appear, and for the employees to form an exit path for me, lined with rose petals. I waited for the heavens to open, for the laurel wreaths to des descend upon my brow, and the angel Gabriel to wing down, slap me with a heavenly high five and some extra Monopoly game tickets and say, you the man, <laughs> you're a good writer. Well, that's not quite what happened. The cashier took the card, said, oh, thanks, shoved it in a shirt pocket, and turned to serve the next customer. Uh, say what? I sat in my car for the next 10 minutes as the tears ran down my face. I don't remember the last time I've ever laughed so hard. God's voice was pretty clear at that moment. I guess you didn't get the memo, ding dong. But you know the gift card giving thing is not really about making you feel better, right? Thanks, God. Got it. Good lesson. Really good yucks. <laughs> Cheers, Hal. <laughs> Hal, I appreciate the humility. I know exactly what that feels like. Um, I, I did the, the viral blessings challenge and took cards uh, for two people, the guy uh, uh, ringing up groceries and the woman who was bagging them. And she was really grateful. You could really tell she was touched by it. But he kind of took it and was like, oh, yeah, thanks. And I think probably a real-life member had already done this for him. So you could tell there was just no novelty to it. He wasn't surprised. He was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, thanks. And I remember thinking, hey, you're supposed to act like I'm a hero or something. 
And uh, it's a good lesson in humility to realize it's not about us. So, so thanks for sharing that very well-written letter. And thanks for, uh, thanks for the humility that went into that. Uh, when, we, when we realize how broken we really are, when we realize that the worst can be brought out of us, we realize that God's love is absolutely the best. The fact that God loves us no matter how messy we are is just outstanding. And, uh, and that's the message for the day. Uh, like if you get it. Uh, comment if you agree. And if you have a story like that this week, send it to me at info at reallife.la. I want to share stories like that. Of course, what we're all discovering in this season are, are just lessons that are already taught in the scriptures, right? Jesus already walked this earth, uh, already lived this life, and uh, left behind lessons that apply uh, very much in our day, 2,000 years later, uh, just as surely as they did uh, back then. So I want to read one of those today. This is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. So a first century disciple named Luke decided to record the story of the life of Jesus and hand that on to us. And this is in Luke chapter 7 in which he describes an interaction between Jesus and someone who realizes that they're broken and someone who doesn't think that they're broken. Uh, follow along with me in the text. Um, actually, let's, as we do this, let's, uh, let's say a word of prayer over the scripture first. Let's pray together. Pray with me. Father, I thank you that you love us. And I thank you that when we're broken, you love us all the more. And I thank you that it's in our brokenness, it's in the mess of this season where we, we weren't as good as we thought we were, where we didn't hold it together as well as we thought we could, that you show up and you forgive us and you bless us and you still call us your sons and daughters. May we feel that deep in our hearts today. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. All right, this is in Luke chapter 7, starting at verse 36. When one of the Pharisees, uh, and now Pharisees, remember, are the Jewish uh, teachers of the law who are very well versed in the scriptures and very self-righteous about it and generally make people feel bad if they are not living the holy lives that they're supposed to. The Pharisees were very clear about who is inside and who is outside, and they were happy to, to throw outsiders out. They were happy to exclude people from the inner circles of, of the Jewish world at the time. So when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Uh, now that's significant. Um, you can have dinner at somebody's house without it meaning much. In Jesus' world, when you had dinner at someone's house, you were identifying with them and associating with them. Uh, you were saying, the two of us are together. Um, and so Jesus actually, Jesus actually does an interesting thing in the first century world. He breaks bread, he shares meals with sinners and outcasts, people who are rejected by everybody else. But here, he also goes and shares a meal with one of the religious insiders. So, so Jesus is actually, he's got friends on both sides of the aisle. And I think his intention actually was to teach people on both sides of that divide to, to love each other. So not only does he go and eat with the sinners, he ends up having dinner at the house of a Pharisee, of a, of a, a very righteous religious person. Verse 37, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Now bear in mind, they didn't have a lot of luxury income. There weren't just little trinkety stores where you could buy gifts. This is a valuable thing she carries. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Foot washing was actually a, a ritual of their day. Um, this is kind of lost on us today because we don't practice it, uh, but it was common. So, for instance, imagine when somebody comes to your, your home and you let them in the door. There's sort of some ritual things you go through. You, you shake hands, you greet each other, maybe they give you a little housewarming gift. You take their coat, you hang it up, you offer them a Coca-Cola. You go through a kind of a, a litany of things that are the ritual of welcoming somebody into your house. Well, in the first century world, people walked around out on dirt roads wearing basic sandals, and their feet would get dirty. And so when they would come to your doorstep, there was usually a servant who would wash their feet. This was a courtesy to them, and it also kept the house clean. Um, you might actually uh, pour oil on their feet. This was like a kind of a, an added uh, uh, a blessing, an added courtesy. This was the mint on the pillow. Uh, this was adding a little, a little product to the, to the washing. Uh, and it was just, it was a sign of luxury. It was a sign of extra courtesy. So here this woman is washing 
Jesus' feet, which would have been a, a standard ritual of the day, except it's not her house. And she uses this expensive perfume. She, she, she sacrifices this, this wealthy gift on him. Verse 39, When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. See, the Pharisees were, uh, were the, the name Pharisee uh, comes from the Hebrew perushim, which means the set-apart ones, the ones who, who stayed separate from unclean people and from other cultures, uh, from outsiders. And so, so the Pharisee sees this woman and says, that's one of the people that we stay away from. If he really, if Jesus really were hearing from God, he would know he should kind of pull back and not, not be associated with her. Verse 40, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher said. Now, Jesus here is fulfilling the role of a prophet. Uh, in the Hebrew Scriptures, there are many prophets. And the prophets would often confront people with the truth of God. They would hear God speak directly to them, uh, to them and then they would speak God's word to the world. Uh, so, the, for instance, there's a, a famous prophet in the Hebrew Scriptures named Nathan. And Nathan at one point goes and confronts a king, King David. Because King David has used his, his power and his might to steal a wife away from one of his soldiers and then put the soldier in a situation where he got killed. He steals this guy's wife and then has him killed. And Nathan goes to David and says, David, let me tell you a story. There was a rich man who had lots of animals on his farm and then a poor man who had only one little sheep and he loved the sheep and the sheep was like a pet to him. And then one day, <coughs> the rich man needed to throw a party but instead of killing one of his sheep to serve at the meal, he went and stole the sheep from the poor man and killed that sheep and used it at his party. Now, O oh king, what should happen to that man? And David goes, that guy ought to die! And Nathan goes, you're the man. You are the man. You stole from somebody who was poor. You took what little he had. You're the man. Um, and so Jesus here is fulfilling the role of a prophet. Jesus sees Simon thinking judgmental thoughts about this poor woman who's doing this gracious thing to Jesus. She realizes how broken she is. She realizes how thankful she is. All she wants to do is pour out her, her thankfulness on Jesus. And Simon just sits there and kind of stews about, oh, she's dirty, you shouldn't be touching her. And Jesus now steps into the role of a prophet and says, Simon, let me tell you a story. Uh, and I say all that to warn you, Anytime a prophet says to you, let me tell you a story, you run away because it's not going to go well for you. You're probably going to be the butt of the joke. When a prophet says to you, let me tell you a story, what's coming next might not be good for you. Uh, and that's what happens here. Jesus says, verse 41, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, which is like a day's wage, and the other 50. So one owed him a little bit, one owed him a ton. Neither of them had money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little." If a prophet starts to tell you a story, be careful. It might not go well for you. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Because they knew only God had the right to forgive sins. So here Jesus is forgiving sins. Kind of gives you a hint as to who Jesus is. Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This sets Jesus apart from all other religious leaders politicians, and philosophers. In Islam, your good works are weighed against your bad, and only if your good works are good enough are you 
ever forgiven. In Confucianism, you are measured against the traditions which you are not allowed to break. In uh, democratic capitalism, you are measured in terms of your success and your productivity. In Christ, you are forgiven. In Christ, you have nothing to prove and nothing to earn. It's exactly when you are at your worst that God's love is the best. In Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. So in all the mess of quarantine, in all the struggles in our families and our homes, in all the anxiety and fear that has, that has taken over and gotten the best of us, you are forgiven. You have been forgiven much. Uh, and God's love is the best. Uh, if uh, homestay has revealed to you that you're not as good uh, a spouse as you thought you were, or you're not as patient a parent as you hoped to be, or you're not as helpful a son or a daughter as you'd always thought you were, or you're not as essential an employee as you felt you should be, or you're not as mentally strong as you believed, in Christ there is all kinds of forgiveness. There is all kinds of forgiveness for us. This is the message of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Uh, it, you are never so contaminated that you have to distance yourself from Him. You are never so dirty that you cannot enter into His presence. You are never so guilty that your life is not a wonderful gift to give to Him. And in return, He will give His life to you. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I'm more broken than I thought I was. I want to give this mess to you. And if you'll take it, I'll let you fix it. Take my life. Come into my life. Restore it. Heal it. Forgive it. And then show me how I should live. And if you do that today, today's the day you become a Christian. Today's the day you step over that line and become a follower of Jesus. And there's nothing more healing and, and nurturing than that. There's, there's nothing more restorative than taking the broken mess of your life and saying, here, Jesus, I can't fix it, and letting him take it and, and work on it. Um, that's, that's the message of the gospel. Uh, I talked to a mom recently uh, who, who just was not sure she could go on. Uh, she felt like she was more of a burden than a help on her family. When God's Spirit lives inside of you, you are always a blessing to the world around you because God's Spirit works through you despite you. It doesn't matter that your life is broken. When God's Spirit is within you, it, work, it works through you to heal and to bless those around you. God wants you in His kingdom. God wants you in this world and has put you here for His purposes. All you have to do is surrender your life to Him and let Him use it the way that He wants to. God can take the worst messes of your life and turn them into a mission. Uh, he can take what, what you've thought has always been a, a problem life and make you into a princess. Uh, he can take a life that you think has just been annoying to everybody else and make you an heir in his kingdom. God wants you and loves you and forgives you and has purpose for, for you. Don't give up. Don't give up. You're right at that, that point where, where the brokenness is something you can hand over to him and say, I see it now. I see it now. Uh, forgive me. Uh, and just like this, this woman who fell at Jesus' feet, Jesus is happy to say, oh, I, I forgive her. I forgive her. Look at how she, look at how she loves. Uh, Simon's actually the one who gets the worst end of the deal because Simon, Simon doesn't, doesn't forgive because Simon doesn't love. Um, if, you're, if you're worried that, um, that God doesn't have the power to fix your messes, that if you think you're the exception to the rule, let me tell you a miracle story that I saw this week. Uh, I'm in a, a class now every week online uh, about uh, healing prayer. And it's a bunch of us in the, you know, the kind of the Brady Bunch grid on the screen. And uh, we talk about prayer and we study the biblical scriptures related to, to prayer and to healing. Uh, and then at the end of the class, the, the teacher said, um, would anyone like prayer for healing? And a woman sort of sheepishly raised her hand and said, yeah, I've, I've had back pain for, for three years and it won't go away. And so he prayed for her and he said, uh, now, uh, get up and walk around your room and, and test it out and see, see if it's any different. So, you know, in, in the awkwardness of the Zoom conversation, she gets up and she walks around her room 
And you can see the surprise on her face, and she goes, it, it doesn't hurt. And she was twisting in all kinds of ways to get it to, to, to hurt. And she goes, it, it doesn't hurt. And I talked to her three days later, and she goes, it's, it's gone. I've had pain for three years, and it's gone. So that happened uh, on, this, on this call. <clears throat> Apparently, uh, prayer works digitally as well. Uh, and then the um, uh, class was kind of winding down, and I sort of had a gut feeling. And I said, now, wait a minute. Is there anybody else on this call who wants prayer for healing? And another woman uh, raised her hand and said, I, ha I have back pain as well. And so we, we prayed for her. And then the, the guy teaching the class said, now get up and walk around and test it out. And you, she walked around her room and you could see the surprise on her face. And she goes, it doesn't, I, can't, I can't make it hurt anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt anymore. And I talked to her a couple days later and the pain was gone. All, all that to say, the God who can straighten spines can surely soften hearts. The God who can, can mend broken backs can surely mend broken lives. There's nothing going on in your life that God can't heal in a real way here today. And that's exactly what God wants to do. <clears throat> in, in the brokenness of our lives, at that point where we are at our worst, it's then that the aroma of Christ can be set free. That in our, our prayers and our confession and our obedience, we anoint Him uh, with perfume. Now, because there is grace in Jesus, you be graceful. Because He lavishes us with forgiveness, you be forgiving. As we, as we reopen society, there's going to be all kinds of inclination to blame and to demonize people. Don't follow the cues of the world around us that tells you to go find some group or individual or leader or party and throw rocks at them. That is not the way of the cross. That is not the way of followers of Jesus. You have been shown immense grace. Now you be graceful. Uh, I remember when I was uh, a child, we used to go on family vacations to the beach in uh, Florida every year. Uh, and I'd uh, sit out on the beach with my little bucket and I'd watch the, you know, I'd sit right where the water came in and I'd watch the little crabs come up in the waves and suddenly they, you know, they'd start burrowing down in the sand. And then I'd take my little, little uh, shovel and I'd dig them back up again and throw them on the sand, right? They, they'd try to get away and I'd dig them back up. Have you ever seen a little hermit crab with its, uh, you know, hard little angry hat? Uh, when, it's, when it's nervous and it feels cornered and it holds up those, those menacing little claws at you and it walks away backwards. They don't actually make noises like that, but I bet that's the noise going on in their head. You know, right? Well, don't be a crabby Christian. As we come up out of our shells, there's going to be all kinds of inclination to fear and to blame and to be angry and throw stones. Greatly you have been forgiven, so greatly you forgive. Live by grace. Live as people of the light. Let God's grace shine through you, because there are going to be all kinds of broken people around you. What they say of Christians is that we are judgmental hypocrites. We talk about love while we hate people. We talk about forgiveness while we hold grudges. Don't let that be you. Who wants to join a church where you're likely to get pinched? Live as people of the light. Live as people of grace. Greatly you have been uh, forgiven, so uh, greatly forgive. Pray for miracles. The God who can straighten, spine, straighten spines can soften hearts. And as God blesses you, may you be a blessing to the world around you. In Jesus' name. God bless you all. I'll look forward to seeing you all next week for worship. Get the supplies that you need for communion so we can celebrate communion together. And as always, uh, if you could uh, continue to bless the church, go to reallife.la slash give and continue to support us as we uh, work through this hard time together. Uh, we'll all come out strong on the other side. And I look forward to worshiping with you again uh, on Reunion Sunday when we can all be together. God bless you. Have a great week. song for our congregation, but I think it's really perfect for this season. It's a reminder that whatever we go through, whatever fire, whatever trial, whatever tribulation, God is with us.
was another in my life standing next to me. There was another. No longer a slave to my skin anymore. 
church that we are not alone that many of us are in a battle right now for for peace for hope um, for so many different things and whatever that battle is with you this morning just embrace the fact that you are not alone that God is with you and he is willing and able to bear all things with you and to do the miraculous so go forth with that promise this week we love you we miss you god bless